Hello there guys, what is going on? Daniel Charles back here again. It's Wednesday. I hope you're all kind of uh, still reveling in last night. Chelsea beating Borussia Dortmund in the Champions League last 16 second leg tie. It feels weird, you know, waking up and doing a news video where we're going to be overly positive about Chelsea and, and start to look with enthusiasm about the future. I mean, I'm just, I'm just not used to it. I, You know, kind of what was the reaction supposed to be last night? It's why I said in my reaction to the game last night that it was kind of a little bit weird. Like, I haven't felt this a lot this season, just not being overly negative about things. And just a wonderful feeling. And hopefully we're going to get a lot more of that moving forward because we just haven't had it at Stamford Bridge for quite a while now. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the game, looking at Graham Potter, kind of the future for him as Chelsea head coach after getting that massive victory last night, his change in approach tactically, what it means for the rest of this season, but maybe even beyond that for the players currently at his disposal, some of those player performances that need to be noted. And then we will look at Mason Mount and his contract situation because this sort of came out a little bit more information before the game. And I do have some stuff to say about it. But before we get into any of that good stuff, if you're feeling happy about Chelsea, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you're new around here so you don't miss any of the uploads. If you're listening on the podcast feed, thank you so much for tuning in. Son of Chelsea is a part of the 90 Min podcast network. So we're going to go through some stats and facts. And I, I just before we get into this, right, because I do want to mention this because it made me sort of chuckle. Scrolling through my phone on the train this morning, just, you know, very much going through all of the great reaction, the videos from last night, the players, their posts about things. Just wonderful to see, right? It's just, it's... I. You know, you go, when Chelsea lose a game, other than me doing this review and editing it, I kind of forget about football and I've had to do that a lot this season. It was so nice to wake up on the morning after a game and just just go through all of it, digest all of it, read articles, re-watch the highlights over and, again, over and over again, watch the press conference, you know, do everything. It's just, it's what you want to see as a fan and hopefully we can do that a lot more. But one of the things I did notice was the reaction to, and BT Sport did this in their analysis, kind of dedicated a lot of time, even when they were interviewing Graham Potter on the touchline, to kind of having to go about the, the penalty incident. On both fronts, and I've actually done, you know, a video for this, uh, for my other role, uh, Curiously Sport, you can go and check it out. We sort of break down the, the two decisions, you know, that have been contested in terms of the penalty itself and it being retaken. I, I do find it curious that when any something like this goes in Chelsea's favour, suddenly we have to, you know, rip up the rule book and we have to change a rule entirely. You know, I just, I highly doubt if that's at Anfield, that discussion is taking place. I highly doubt if Manchester United have that moment, it's taking place. I know that's very biased, but I just, it just seems to be when Chelsea, when something goes in Chelsea's favour, suddenly the game is broken and we need to change it. Yeah, it just seems highly convenient. But... In the sense of, you know, Chelsea and, you know, looking at this game and look at what it meant and looking at what it meant for Graham Potter. Just incredible scenes and, and wonderful to be there. My voice is recovering from last night at Stamford Bridge. But just some cool tweets to, to bring up here. Uh, CFC Central um, noting that last night was the fifth time out of eight occasions that Chelsea have turned around a Champions League first leg deficit football heritage you know you think back to some of the great Champions League nights where Chelsea have done that at Stamford Bridge uh, after losing the first leg I mean Barcelona is kind of the one that stands out Napoli in 2012 is probably still the best one in terms of what Chelsea had to come back from but uh, and PSG of course in the quarterfinal in 2014 it's nice we have another one of those to add on to the list I saw another tweet from someone saying that despite this being an awful season from a Chelsea fan's point of view we had a night that, you know, in in Europe last night at Stamford Bridge that Arsenal and Tottenham would probably have as kind of one of their greatest ever nights in Europe, which, you know, says a lot about the pedigree Chelsea are at, at, at a European level. Just looking at some player performances in more depth here, Ben Chirwell, who was outstanding last night. I think if you gave him man in a match, I wouldn't really argue that much with you. 100% tackles won, assisted the first goal for Chelsea and won the penalty for Chelsea second. He was absolutely phenomenal last night to his best kind of those levels of performances we saw under Thomas Tuchel just great to see from Squawker here no player won possession more times in the Champions League on Tuesday night than Enzo Fernandez. that was 10 times a big performance from him Kai Havertz who had an outstanding performance last night also I think could have been man of the match for a lot of people looking at his goals for Chelsea in the Champions League of course the final against Man City in 2021 that won the cup the group game against Malmo the round of 16 against Lille last season the quarter final against Real Madrid the group game against Salt 
Salzburg, which got Chelsea through to the knockout stages this season. And then, of course, the round of 16 goal last night against Dortmund. Four out of six in the knockout stages. That kind of knack that Havertz has to score big goals for Chelsea in big moments, which for all the criticism I've had about him and his performances and what he could do at Chelsea, that is a very special talent for someone to have. And let us hope there are more big Champions League goals for, for Kai Havertz in the future, hopefully this season in, in the next round. The next thing I'm going to move on to is Graham Potter because obviously he's been the centre of attention, the centre of a lot of criticism, a lot of harsh criticism in recent weeks. I think a lot of it has been fair, particularly in terms of some of those dire performances and, and the lack of progression and the lack of a vision that, that fans could really cling on to and also the lack of that connection. And I kept saying that there's those intangible things that I think supporters need to, to get on board with a head coach and those moments within difficult seasons that you still need to have to keep people along, you know, to get people on board with your kind of direction. And Graham Potter needed, and he needs to have more. It's not just one night. He needs to have more nights like last night to grow that connection with the supporters at home, to, to give those performances to rile everyone up and gets everyone united behind the team. That was the wonderful thing about last night, that despite all of the, the downbeat sort of mood around this season and frustration, the fact that that crowd turned up last night and were ready to get behind the team as loudly as they did from the off, I think was special. And I think it's a real positive sign that Potter was able to harness that and the players were and they turned up and they gave that crowd an amazing performance too. And, and hopefully that can be something that can build over a period of time. You know, we, we, you know, in kind of defense of Potter, people have brought up comparisons to other coaches in recent years at other English clubs who have had long term success and have been given patience. But I think that the notable thing is, is those coaches have either won trophies or got to finals quite early on. For Potter, this is one step and he needs to keep doing it. Uh, Matt Law's post-match piece, uh, one of his post-match pieces here, um, that Graham Potter had heart-to-heart -heart chats, which helped save his Chelsea job. Apparently, Telegraph Sport understands that Potter has held a number of personal talks with players, staff and members of Chelsea's board, including Todd Bowley and Bailey Barley, over the past week to reassure individuals of his plans and listen to any concerns or suggestions they had. You know, whatever it was last night that, that conjured that performance and improvement, it worked. And I, and I think that someone, you know, mentioned to me and I, I agreed that, you know, you look at last night's performance and there was something about it that it was almost like Chelsea had just changed head coach and had got a boost from a, a new voice. And the fact that Potter throughout his, his difficulties in recent weeks was able to galvanise that out of these group of players, I think says a lot in a difficult moment. Because I genuinely was getting to the point after Southampton and Spurs of, of feeling like, is there anything left of him to, to galvanise these players? Because we've seen it so often, you see it across so many football clubs, when a, when a coach is done, they are done. And it's very hard to resurrect those players behind them. And it could have been very easy for Chelsea players on Saturday to turn to not turn up. And uh, we would have seen more discontent and that would have really put Graham Potter on the brink. And then, of course, to come up against the side in Borussia Dortmund, who I stressed before the game, had won 11 in a row before facing Chelsea last night. These are not mugs. These are not, you know, it's not a club that Chelsea and a team that Chelsea based on form should just be rolling over. They didn't roll them over, but Chelsea over the course of two legs deserve to go through. That in itself should give Graham Potter a lot of credit in terms of what he can do on the biggest stage. Um, as I say, it's about backing it up now with consistent results and performances. And where do Chelsea go next? I think that's the big question in terms of Graham Potter's approach for the rest of this season. I think based on the last two performances and results, it will be a 3-4-3 moving forward. I think it will be something that he's going to lean into a lot more, uh, which then begs the question, why did he move away from it? But I'm not going to sit here and be disingenuous. I have wanted to see Chelsea move to a 4-3-3. But you have to be humble enough, you know, as myself and say, I'm probably wrong about that, you know, in terms of the current squad and in terms of the current profile, we still maybe lack the players to do it. And maybe Potter as a coach lacks the, the ability at the moment and the power given, you know, how big of a squad he has to enact that change. But that could still be a long term thing. He simply on, on a base level needs to get himself to the summer. And if the this change back to a 3-4-3, three, three, a system that has worked for a lot of players within this squad in recent years, gets him those results, gets him that buy-in and gets him to the summer, then I think happy days. I, you know, I know there's a lot of people who've been very critical of Potter and now are kind of throwing their hands up saying, where is the process? Why have we gone all pr pragmatic? What is it saying about the long-term project? You know, I, d I don't think you can advocate short-term results and short-term methods when I'm seeing people call for Jose Mourinho to come back. And then when those kind of short-term methods are enacted by the current head coach, you then complain as well. I mean, I just, it's the 
classic taking multiple positions at the same time to try and spike the manager. I, ju I just don't, I don't think that carries much weight. I've also seen some spin, unfortunately, since last night trying to claim that Graham Potter, well, Graham Potter doesn't, doesn't deserve that much credit for last night's uh, result and performance. It's actually the fact that well, it's just Chelsea. It's a big European night and he's kind of, he's been dragged to this level uh, because his job was at threat. Again, it's just ridiculous. You know, it shouldn't just be based on one night that you completely change your opinion on Graham Potter if you don't think he's the right coach for Chelsea. But I don't think your whole argument around Graham Potter is completely undermined if you just say, yeah, he got it right against Borussia Dortmund. Now we need to see it for the long term. I think that's a fair... Why can't people just at times give a little bit of credit? You know, your, your whole argument doesn't have to be undermined and deconstructed. I have consistent criticisms of Kai Havertz, but I'd be a complete idiot if I came on camera and tried to deny that he had a brilliant performance last night. Because it just would be dishonest. It just wouldn't, you know, the facts and reality don't bear that out. So I just would like to see a little bit of humility at times from people to say, yeah, he got it right on that night. I don't know if Graham Potter is going to still be the right man for Chelsea in the long term. I can't give you that assurance right here. But I'd like to think that last night hopefully could be a turning point for him as a Chelsea head coach and for these players to, to improve their performances for the rest of the season. But we will see how that goes. But at least we're moving into the next few games and weeks with a much more positive outlook on the way things are, are going to be. So those are my thoughts on, on Graham Potter. And I know you guys will still have your doubts and I think you're fair too given the, the struggles we've seen this season but let's just hope that at least with the Champions League Graham Potter and these players have something to fight for for the rest of this season and we will see how the draw plays out I'm going for Benfica simply on expected narrative given Enzo Fernandez and also 2012 roll it back quarter final but there are obviously some big teams in there and when we can sit back and relax and enjoy the rest of the knockout ties to see who Chelsea could potentially get. The last thing to sort of speak about here is Mason Mount, and it is a slightly more negative thing. Um, we've delved into the Mason Mount contract situation, I think, enough in recent months. If you want to go and see sort of talks I've had with with Adam Newsom guests on the channel, but just myself, we, we've been covering this story for a while and and looking at the way it sort of turned and, and you know, gone from positive to negative, optimistic to pessimistic in terms of whether he's going to stay, whether he's going to leave. I have spoke about how I think if Mason Mount does leave Chelsea, he probably is going to one of Chelsea's supposed big rivals in Liverpool and Man City. That's the level of club he would leave. And it did, you know, it was kind of ironic and, and, and maybe said something about the way his season's going that Chelsea had that performance last night and Mason Mount wasn't involved. You know, it, that would have been a ridiculous thing to think a year ago, given how important Mason Mount has been. But Simon Johnson was reporting in a mailbag he did via Athletic that talk of Mason Mount demanding 300k a week apparently is not true. But he has turned down some offers, which are certainly in the region of what James has been given uh, with his contract uh, earlier this season. But it's been further complicated with things like image rights bonuses and length of contract. And then he goes into sort of whether agreement it will be reached before this season, which obviously could mean that he, he could leave um, this summer and Chelsea may feel that they should cash in on him. My take on this, um, and I did tweet about this um, because it is a growing frustration of mine. It's just something I see so consistently and I've seen with a number of Chelsea players over the, the past few seasons is the entitlement of some who feel that they have full control over players' contract decisions and, and whether they stay, whether they go, whether they are, you know, players should, should just sign on a dotted line no matter what. It is their careers and I do not begrudge a player for not looking at the club the same way I do because they are a player, they are a, a professional, even if they have come through the academy and it's quite clear Mason Mount, like Rhys James, has deep affiliation with this club. But I don't, you know, begrudge a player for looking at, out for their own best interest. You know, I don't, in any case, and I'll, I'm going to reference Andreas Christensen here, had his old contract situation and people were getting really angry at him for not signing the contract. You know, and, and what I didn't like about the briefing at that time, and particularly Thomas Tuchel coming out publicly and saying stuff, is, is given you have this whole club and legion of very loyal fans, particularly with the, the atmosphere of social media, you know, kind of going against one player. And I don't think that's very healthy. And... Also, you have to understand the reality of negotiations is they go back and forth. A player who is going to commit their long-term future, particularly Mason Mount, given the age he is now, he'd be committing his prime years to Chelsea. There is going to be back and forth. Mason Mount has done a lot of things in his career, um, despite, you know, people will just point to the last six or seven months where he hasn't been at his best. But there's a lot of evidence 
in his back catalogue now at Chelsea that he's a very important player and can be a defining player for this club on the biggest of occasions. So he wants, obviously, to be paid like that type of player when there probably would be offers for him to go elsewhere. You know, fans feel they kind of have ownership over these players in a sense of, over what they do. And I just think it's more healthy to, to look at these players maybe not with that kind of perspective. We want to have deep connections with players. Obviously, we do because uh, it's, it's part of what makes supporting a club special is you have your favourite players. But I also just think that it's a little bit unhealthy to kind of go at them when there's contract situations going on based on reports that maybe isn't giving you the full context, maybe isn't giving you both sides of the story and um, kind of always to me kind of leans in painting the the, the player themselves over a, a big club as kind of... A, sort of the antagonist in a situation which I just don't think is, is very healthy and I think maybe should be looked at with more nuance I know social media doesn't provide that a lot of the time but whether Mason Mount stays or go I think that's irrelevant to the wider point of of just understanding how complex maybe negotiations over, over long-term contracts are at this level uh, so we will see how it plays out but those are my thoughts on the situation but that is it for this edition of Let's Talk Chelsea make sure to follow me on Twitter at Sona Chelsea if you're listening on the podcast please do drop us a positive rate and review it really does help out and I will see you again very soon all the best mm-hmm.